let evening come. Let the light of late afternoon shine through chinks in the barn, moving up the bales as the sun moves down. Let the cricket take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass. Let the stars appear and the moon disclose her silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den. Let the wind die down. Let the shed go black inside. Let evening come. To the bottle in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to air in the lung, let evening come. Let it come as it will, and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless. So let evening come. Jane Kenyon. And uh, one less well known. Uh, by me, called Sister Marie Angelica plays badminton, <laughs> which is also the first line. Sister Marie Angelica plays badminton with Sister Marie Modeste most afternoons. Today, because of lengthy vespers, they are late. A pale moon has already risen, and early bats are darting like black shuttled cocks. Except for the whisper of wings and the sisters' hushed encouragement, the only sounds are the plinking of rackets and a monotone of morning doves. On all sides of the court, the sculpted you in cubes and columns might pass for black, so deeply green it grows. And now it moves closer, Marie Angelica would say, who has been known to have visions. Though she moves as aptly as the bats, doesn't miss a shot. When she fades for a long one from Marie Modeste, sways on her toes, arches her back, raises one arm and the other to keep her difficult balance, she is lost. A long-legged girl, again in mare's tail, mullion, milkweed, leaning on the sudden sky as, as if it can sustain her like a hand in the small of her back. It does. Her nerve ends quick as a shiver of poplar, arms like branches in a wind. She feels a cry begin to rise, to force the self before it, and burst all colors one, that white. It vaults straight up, a feathered cry that hovers in the heart of heaven, hovers and plummets to the gut of the racket she sights it in, the perfect bird, the shovelcock. Marie Angelica keeps in play, will not let fall, despite the darkness gathering. I think we've been doing this for a year and a half, and I was trying to think which parlor were we using at this time last year? And I don't even remember. So I so appreciate Leon opening his cafe to us and letting us do this once a month. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Leon. I, I do, I really appreciate all of you. I couldn't really imagine a better way to spend a Saturday afternoon than with friends of lovers of poetry and good music. So this is absolutely perfect. Um, John is going to introduce, well, before, let me say, I really enjoy the young, I think I was calling it emerging voices or something like that, but I think it's so important to hear the young voices that we have in our community. In addition to the voices that have, are more experienced, I just really enjoy that. So John has connections and he was able to provide us with a, a young emerging voice. So John is going to do the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm so excited about today. I told Katie this is going to be, this will be among the finest uh, readings 
uh, ever in this series. Um, you know, we're really fortunate uh, in Connecticut that there are so many really, really wonderful ways that our young people can be involved in poetry. Lots of ways to receive awards and well-deserved recognition. There's the Connecticut Writing Project uh, up at UConn run by Jason Cordemanch. Every year, student poets are recognized uh, with the Connecticut Student Writers Award, which includes recognition and a reading and a publication in a journal. There's Upwards Poetry, run by our darling and dear friend Elizabeth Thomas. Uh, it's referred to loosely as a slam team, uh, but it's so much more than that. Uh, Elizabeth is tireless. She offers up workshops and readings and slam competitions, and uh, the program is thriving. In fact, last week, uh, I spent the day with Elizabeth and with Matt's sister, Emily, teaching at the Bushnell, teaching workshops to high school kids. And about 100 kids showed up who wanted to hang out and read and write poems, you know? I mean, um, and then there's the Poetry Out Loud competition, which is a little different. That's the national recitation contest. And that's for high school kids, and they have to memorize, you know, three poems, pre 20th century, 25 lines or fewer, and a poem of their choice. And they compete at their high school. And then the high school winner competes at the state level, the state champion, besides getting $500 to buy poetry books for their school, gets $200 for him or herself, and they get an all expenses paid trip to Washington, D.C. to compete uh, at the Nationals. And the National Poetry Out Loud winner, besides that recognition and that achievement, gets $20,000. So that's a fabulous thing. Um, and then there's the Connecticut Poetry Series, the Connecticut Poetry Series. And in fact, uh, our guest today, our, our first reader, is a former uh, Connecticut poet from, from that series. And just to tell you how long that series has been around, I was a Connecticut student poet in uh, like 1970. <laughs> but it's a, it was a life-changing, It was a life-changing experience because uh, students from all of the various colleges and universities around Connecticut submit their work. Four or five students are chosen as the winners, and you go on tour. You read with your three or four colleagues all over Connecticut at all the universities and colleges, and you get paid. Uh, I remember when I did it, I got $35 a reading, which was, I thought was, I mean, I think I'm still blown away by the fact that somebody gave me $35 to read poems, even back in, in those days. So, so I'm so delighted today that uh, Julia Bonavis is here. Um, she is uh, a junior at Eastern. She's, she's studying secondary education and, of course, creative writing. And as I said, uh, this past spring was, in fact, uh, a Connecticut student poet. She tells me that her life goal is to become a better writer than she was yesterday while simultaneously passing along what she learns to anyone who is willing to listen. She also told me that she's part child wrangler, wrangler, part child wrangler, and part poet. And I have no idea what that means, so <laughs> maybe she can explain that to us. So I'm very happy to, to welcome Julia Bynum. self-professed child wrangler, um, so it's a very serious occupation. I work at a daycare, so I am wrangling children all the day long, um, and then writing poems about them, so it evens out. Um, and oddly enough, one of my first poems is about um, one of my friends, Lydia. She is eight years old, and one of the most incredible humans I've ever met. 
So yeah, this is about Lydia. It's a, called a pocket-sized poem about Lydia. I have only known you for a few minutes, but somehow I am already convinced that all eight years of you is perfect. Youngest of ten, you are the spitfire bookend of this Edwards legacy. I try and teach you how to do cartwheels on the soccer field at the middle school. Your red bow unravels with each flip of your half-grown limbs. I watch in admiration as you chase after your biggest brother, threatening to hit him if he doesn't throw the frisbee to you. Tiny fists waving like a little warrior, you are obstinate in your refusal to go unheard, something I am still learning how to be. I'd like to ask you to teach me how to shout at the top of my lungs for the things I want, for the dreams I have, for the people I love, to teach me how to speak. Thank you. Okay, so this next poem is called AA. I am a rare breed of daughter. In all my meager 20 years, never made witness to drunk parents, always brought up to believe we are a family clean of bad habits. But on the road in between somewhere and home, my mother calmly confesses a family secret. My uncle is a recovering alcoholic, born in the blood of a great grandfather who is only stories to me. A legacy of addiction that miraculously skipped her own father bore its ugly head in the birth of her second big brother. Every day he goes to AA and brings cookies. They are his secret second set of family I never knew about. The uncle I know by his laugh, crooked teeth and love of food, cars, and cats, the one who almost died before they gave him a new aorta, has cheated death more times than last I counted. I understand now when my soft mother hardens over at the thought of her babies getting drunk on a summer Saturday night. We are the seeds of chance she has planted. Only time will tell of the things we grow inside of us. Um, so this third poem I have is entitled Jacob, um, and it's dedicated to um, him, this little boy that passed away a couple weeks ago. I stand on wet pavement, yellow leaves like teardrops point in every direction. My rain boots firmly planted, stock still at the side of my car, I think of him. Skin turning pale yellow, the unforeseen fifth season of childhood cancer, fallen too soon from his family tree. So this last poem I have is about my Grammy. Um, yeah, I don't want to say any more than that. You'll figure out who she is after I read this. <laughs> so it's called, I Want to Write a Poem to Celebrate. I want to write a poem to celebrate my grandmother's brain and the few things it forgets. The rotating library full of acquired catalog knowledge, memories, Random family artifacts, bits of trivia, recipes for food, and remedies for healing yourself. The names of anyone she has ever met, and the long lists of people she prays for. I want to celebrate the way all five feet of her body moves in the process of remembering. I have her hands alongside words paint pictures in the air. The way she adjusts her glasses, fixes her silvered hair, wipes the edges of her mouth with her forefinger and thumb, rubs her palms on her thighs, repeats. When her voice raises and pace quickens, she builds momentum, filling entire rooms with passion and colors they have yet to name. At family gatherings, she recounts each child or grandchild's flawed moments with tender affection. The time I ate too many brownies she baked and felt sick, or the time my uncles threw my mother down the laundry chute. Her goofy laugh is a sound I will not quickly forget. Once she starts, she never stops remembering. Each newspaper article, book, photograph, or face she has read serves as a domino, triggering another piece of past to fall from the corners of her mind. 
I want to celebrate her steadfast pursuit of truths and knowledge, the way she always makes room in her mind for more of everything and everyone. While my grandfather's memory slowly turned to dirt in the senior center garden, she recalls enough of our collective histories for the both of them. The matriarchal oracle who holds our entire past, present, and future within her. She is everything I am and all that I hope to be. Thank you. a lot like the grandmother you described. She, she sounds absolutely wonderful. Our next poet is a poet I've been trying to get for a very long time. <laughs> I have. I really have. Um, there was there was a poetry emergency. We we were we were down a poet. So I, I emailed a couple of people. One being Penelope Pelzan. I need a poet. And she said, you have to ask Sean. And I said, Penelope, I've asked him several times. And he said, no. He's a very busy gentleman, and I'm glad that he's here today. Sean Frederick, Frederick Forbes is an assistant professor in residence of English at the, and the director of the Creative Writing Program at the University of Connecticut. His poems have appeared in Chagrin River Review, Sargrasso, a journal of Caribbean literature, language and culture, Crab Orchard Review, Long River Review, and Midwest Quarterly. In 2009, he received a Woodrow Wilson Mellows Mays University Fellows Travel and Research Grant from Prudentia, Columbia. I asked Sean about this. I said, what are all those, what does that really mean? He said, basically, they gave me a good amount of money to travel and write, which is fantastic. His first book of poetry came from that, and it was published in 2013. He co-edited as a collection of personal narratives titled, What Does It Mean to Be White in America? Breaking the White Code of Silence, Personal Narratives by White America, which was published in 2016. John, thank you for coming today. to be here with I, my current student, Ali, is in the audience, and then a former student, Brendan, is here with his dad, and then Ali has brought her parents, and then a soon-to-be student, Sierra, is in the audience. My gosh, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like the playboy of the Western world. Um, it feels wonderful. Katie, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to to come here and read. I, I was very busy all of last year. I was on a book tour. Um, and so now I'm not. And it feels wonderful to take a breather. But but Katie had asked me, when you got the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, um, what did you do? And essentially they gave me like $15,000 to travel and do ethnographic work. And that essentially just meant I was interviewing distant cousins and drinking copious amounts of alcohol. <laughs> I'm just reporting on it. And so that was that was it. So it was fun. Um, so if you can get a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship and travel somewhere, please apply. It's wonderful. Um, so a lot of people ask me, like, what's the title of your book, Providencia, mean? And so both sets of my grandparents, as well as my mother, come from a tiny island off the eastern coast of Nicaragua. It's situated in the Caribbean Sea, just below um, Jamaica. And it has an entire landmass of four miles. Tiny. Everyone is related. <laughs> Everyone is related. And so I had this surreal moment when I visited in 2009 where I'm just walking around and I'm like, those are my lips, that's my nose, that's my forehead. And it was just so bizarre. But when you have this tiny island, you know, remember that big world map at school? You can't find it if it's four miles in total landmass. So for me, it never existed in my, in my thought pattern. I knew that my grandfather 
um, visited there every other year to live with his mistress for a year, and then he would come back and live with my grandmother. They had a very interesting arrangement. They were good Catholics in that way. Um, and so I knew it existed, but I couldn't find it on a map. And then suddenly when I was about 21 years old, I had another fellowship to travel to Barbados, and I found this very good comprehensive map of the Caribbean, and there was the island of Providencia that was finally carted on it. And then I started writing these, these poems. Um, and, and what's interesting about the island of Providencia is that um, it's, it's a protectorate of Colombia, South America, but it was established in the 1600s by the British East India Company. So it was a British colony for years, then it became a Spanish colony, then it became an English colony, then it became a Spanish colony. You see the trend here that happens for 250 years. Um, but rightly, what happens is that um, Providencia is situated in Nicaraguan waters. So if you're ever out to sea, the Nicaraguan Coast Guard will come to get you, not the Colombian Coast Guard. Um, so, so it's quite interesting. So I'll just read some poems from, from my collection, which is on sale for $10, uh, if you'd like to buy it. And I'll, I'll autograph it. Um, and then I'll read some new poems, if, if you don't mind. How, how many minutes do I have, roughly? 20, 20 is good. Let me, let me set my timer. Okay. The only thing you need to know about this poem is that gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. Gnosis. After burning my right arm from a skillet with scalding canola oil, I fainted. I was four. Perhaps the pain was extreme, or the stench of my delicate flesh quickly cooking did it. I was losing my sense of touch. My arm is a geography of scars. I can point out South and Central America from my index finger to the base of my thumb. The skin becomes darker on my forearm, like an ocean where the spotted river sticks, where my hairs are the rooted dead. My elbow is a rust color, cracked dry like the Sahara. I cut it once, the blood poured out like sweet water. My fingers went numb as my grandmother patched me up. I was 10, and for therapy she advised writing to renew my skin. For years, I wrote without pen or paper, remembering stories, reciting phrases until I was 18. Then I began to tear away all I knew, ideas, images, facts, as delicate as corn silk. My arm warmed, my fingers swollen and red, but the pen now steady in my hold. mentioned uh, she has a great um, phrase in her poem about her grandmother that she's this matriarchal oracle. Um, and what we know about the oracles um, in, in Greek mythology is that they spoke in tongues and they gave these wonderful visions of what would happen in the future. What really happened was that they were inhaling the sulfur and were probably getting high and having hallucinations. Um, <laughs> And so I was thinking about like an oracle and the formation of the island of Providencia, which is actually volcanic. Um, so this is called an oracle remembering Providencia's formation. Now I am a gentle voice in the wind, barely audible in a violent storm. But once I walked earth imbued with power that could scorch the sun. Days before the explosion, the Earth's core whispered in my ear how it envied the dark ocean depths. Trouble began at sunrise with rumbling underwater tremors. My pulse throbbed for hours, blue veins bulging, white smoke puffing out of my open pores thousands of feet into the air, as if to say, breathe in the burnt dust, sulfur, and salt. And so I did. My expressions turned lyrical, raised eyebrows, blossoming pupils, triumphant nostrils. 
slimy ochre sand bubbled from the ocean, slowly hardening. I was lifted above, its jagged peaks tore into my feet, and soon I was drained of blood. Waves, steady ripples surged through me, utterances of a new language so charming. The Earth's core spoke solemnly that my fate was to be a tender voice in the wind, that the land would always feel my former body's pulse. I was to oversee the hundreds of years of erosion necessary to sculpt the figure of a man's head from the sea. Hence the title, cover. Who's my grandfather? Um, so. Do you have There's a resemblance. Do you have poems about your grandpa? Oh boy. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, there, there are more poems about my grandmother in here um, than my grandfather. Uh, yeah, there, I do have one poem about my grandfather. What's here? It's, it's titled Man's Worth. Um, and so, so my grandfather passed away in 2004, but this was written before he had passed away. Um, and and um, he died of cancer. I don't remember how I held the blade, which side, angle of motion my hand took, because I was confined only to my grandfather and his space. I was 13 and shaving peach fuzz, afraid of pressing against his thin, peeling skin with an old-fashioned razor. He asked me to shave off his beard in the bedroom my grandmother once shared with him. The ICU, he joked. His chocolate skin was pale like the thin film cooling cocoa leaves. When I looked at his Adam's apple, my hand shook. The delicate cartilage showed thick scars of razor bumps. Steady with that part, he said, but I wasn't, couldn't. Slicking him with that burn he knew too well, he made me finish. He asked that I rub lotion on first to his hollowed cheeks and wrinkled upper lip, then bathe his face in cologne because the cancer stank, and we both wanted to renew his old mornings, making him smell irresistible a man embraced by liquid flannel. But if my grandmother had access to a college education, she would be the next CEO of a major corporation. She sold Tupperware, and she was the best seller for, I think, 10 years straight in the 1980s, because what she would do is she would go door to door, and she would take her cute little grandson along with her. And all of these older women would, of course, bring us into their houses, and I would sit down and I would have cookies and cake and tea and all these things, and my grandmother would say, don't you need Tupperware to put those things in? Brilliant. Brilliant. And we'd come out and she would sell like $500 worth, and we'd go to the next house and another $500 worth. I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, Conviction is what I think about her. She's 92 years young. She has an 80-year-old boyfriend. Uh, she, she loves the senior center. In her purse, she carries a tube of Givenchy lipstick and rosary beads and a switchblade. Okay? So in, in one outing, she's ready to meet a man, she's ready to meet her maker, and she's ready for a fight. I mean, she has all the bases covered. So that gives you a sense of like the type of um, woman she is. <laughs> um, I think the only thing you need to know here is that the there, there's a name of the town called Lazy Hill, 
which is in Providencia, and it's it's the it's like a hamlet of of the of the town, and um, that's where my grandmother came from. So, Aaron, 1949, Eileen in Providencia. The main road is a dirt road. From Lazy Hill to town, it's more than an hour on foot. But she refuses to ride side saddle on her brother's horse. She's wearing open-toed high heels. Her thick black hair is twisted into a fat chignon. Her silky floral dress clings to her stomach. The women notice the slight bulge, anticipating the disfigurement of motherhood for her, while their husbands crave the perspiration gathering in her cleavage. She walks into the bank, her dusty suede heels sparking hard against the tiled floor, sweet and sirenic. She spends 15 minutes writing a telegram to her husband in Curaçao. She pictures him kissing his mistress as she shoves the form to the clerk. He reads the line, that barren woman will lose her scent. Stop, come back. She sees the clerk write this down on a separate piece of paper, knowing he will give it to his wife later. She pays the fee, refuses to thank him, and slowly leaves the bank, cautious as a freed slave. So that gives you a sense of my grandmother. Yeah. So, I, so I told you about all those interviews, and I interviewed a lot of elderly men who said, oh my god, your, your grandmother had the best body. <laughs> That's all they would say. I, mean, I don't want to hear this about my grandmother, but yet she, she liked to put on a show, is what they said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they told you that story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a good story. And she, she was wearing five-inch stiletto heels back in the 40s. <laughs> so, um, has anyone written haikus before? Wonderful, wonderful form. Very difficult to write in, however. I mean, you have um, five syllables and seven syllables in the next line and then five syllables. It sounds very easy. Actually, it's, it's not because um, you have to include an element of narrative, an element of nature, um, and the, the speaker has to be very present. And I grew up in Southside Jamaica, Queens, which um, produced a lot of rappers. Um, like whom? 50 Cent, Lil' Kim, who else? Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Nicki Minaj. <laughs> And so these were my brethren. These were people I was on the bus with and would talk to. But um, Southside Jamaica Queens was incredibly dangerous. Drive-by shootouts, um, drug deals, everywhere that you could possibly think of. And my grandmother was not having it. She, she reigned supreme. I mean, the drug dealers feared her. <laughs> okay. They just feared her. And so I thought, I need to create a haiku sequence that talks about my grandmother. And, and, and once again, just common sense. She was just observant. She, she knew how to make a bad situation better. So it's called Haiku, Winters in Southside Jamaica, Queens. My grandmother praised the deep silence of winter, drug deals forced indoors. No summer drive-bys or innocent neighbors lost to dull black semis. We live on a block of 10 row houses, can hear every goddamn sound. Eight in the morning, my boots should crunch snow instead of pink topped crack files. Hey yo, curly top, you got a sister? Bet she'll give me some fine trim. Grandma pays for, uh, prays for me to fail the ghetto before puberty sets in. Damon approaches me, asks if I want to make a large roll of cash. Christmas Eve, best friend shot dead, closed casket, barely a face left on him. Morning, purple sky, two drug dealers escort mom to the train station. Damon slams me up against a brick wall, 
whispers, he likes boys my size. Boy, you, gotta, you better get your hide home. Your grandmama worried sick about you. Grandma delivers plates of ackee and codfish to every drug house. Spark of a fired gun in cold night air, Damon holds my trembling right hand. Grandpa spends every winter with his lover in Providencia. Neighbors wonder why we've never been robbed, even though Grandpa's not here. Undercover cop busts Damon, 20 to life. That's the word at church. She dreams he takes his woman to secret islands deep beneath the sea. Grandma holds a lunch, tells neighbors to befriend those kids they fear the most. The blare of sirens, helicopter high above, sounds I heard all night. whether it's periodot or periodo, it's, it's a gemstone. What's the proper pronunciation? You know, you, no one knows. Periodo. I think it's periodo. It sounds nicer that way, right? <laughs> um, and, and the thing about it is that the, the more iron in its chemical composition, the more, um, I guess, more vibrant it's glow. And so I was, I was, this is when I was an undergraduate student, I was taking um, a class in geography and we were learning about gemstones. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. How can I make this into a poem? <laughs> <laughs> Science is very important in poetry. And I, I think, I think more, more poets and writers need to start using science because you can, you can get so much gemstone. Oh, I think the only thing you need to know is that the, the male speaker's mother's name is Mercedes, um, which is my mother's middle name, um, and that's about it. So, gemstone. Most days, Mercedes stares into my glowing absinthe core. Today, she savagely turns me around her ring finger using her left thumb. She tells her mother I give off pulses of desire at night welts form along her neck and chest, long and spiky as blood lily petals, when she glides me across her body. She wants to obey an inner calm, but her hands shake. To steady her nerves, she scrapes away clear nail polish, each fleck a minor indiscretion, and thinks of the sun she almost forsook for his love of men. As he grew inside her, he kicked every night. Hives covered her belly. He was breech up to the eighth month, and the call on his face at birth an amazing sign she could not decipher. She smelled the infant's first breaths and bit her lips in fright. Already he was demanding her attention. That midnight I was given to her, and her mother said, give it power. Staring into me, she felt my heat soothe the wilderness of her mind. She threw her wedding, her wedding band across the room, and she began the electricity that passes back and forth between us. The older woman believes my stone offers her daughter a chemical balance, but little does she know that I extract iron from her daughter's blood to enhance my stunning glow. Woo. I'll read one more. Do you guys like racy poems? Like yeah. sexually charged poems? Yeah, no. Girlfriends? No. <laughs> That's the first time I've got clearly a no. Is everyone familiar with um, Rudolf Nureyev? Yes, yes. He was here in Hartford. Years ago. Yeah. Wonderful um, ballet dancer. 
And um, is anyone familiar with the Rondo? It has this incredible rhyme scheme that I think you'll be able to hear. Um, so this is called Rondo for the Nuri of Nude. Um, the photographer Richard Abaddon took the photo of um, Nuri of Nude on July 25th, 1961, but it wasn't printed until 1999 um, because Nuri of had the rights, the sole rights to it. And then when he passed away, his estate decided to sell um, the rights to it. And it's from um, 20 by 16 inches, so it's quite large. Um, where is it? I don't know where it's housed right now, um, but that's a that's a good question. So um, think think of largeness, think of nude. <laughs> He's 23, glows a pale hue, large penis dangling in full view. His bush dark, unkempt to enhance, his this member hidden in his pants. Ballet's bad boy before his cue. Naval diadem worn by few, chiseled torso slightly askew, body in contrapposto stance, simple, male, nude. Thirty-eight years before its debut, the trick beside me has no clue. It's the tartar's dick making me dance, grinding my hips, held in its trance. I'm center stage, made anew, simple. Male nude. Yeah. <laughs> right, so I'll end there and just to start on three. Mm, maybe I'll give you two new poems. And um, after it took me ten years to write my first book, and. Um, I completed it, finally put the, the final period in 2011 onto the last poem, and then I didn't write for three years. At all. Because I thought, well, what if this is all I've got? And then it took me two years to get it published. It was finally published in 2013. Got it published, went on a book tour, still hadn't written anything was trying to figure out what's going on here. And if I did write something, it was gibberish. It didn't make any sense. Last year, I started writing again. And it came out in this torrent. And so now I'm having to figure out what, what to do. Um, I'll probably start, but this is racy again. I'm sorry. <laughs> A little bit of backstory in terms of how I'm thinking about the male speaker. He is gay and mixed race, and he is the product of his mother's rape. So he does not know who his father is. His mother is um, Irish American, and after he is born, she is placed in an insane asylum because she cannot look at her son. Um, and he is then raised by his maternal grandparents who are vehemently racist and vehemently hate him and remind him of this. And so um, at, when he turns 17, they kick him out of the house and he is left to fend for himself. Um, and so this, this is a moment where um, he, he turns to um, prostitution um, because he wants to go back to school um, and, and he has to find a way to, to, to get money. So it's called um, <clears throat> There But For The Taking. I'm lucky if we see each other every other week, a few hours to connect. Again, you mention how quiet I am. I'm listening to the timbre of your voice, the soft giggle that takes over as soon as you're high. We've known what it means to be hungry, drenched from autumnal rain. We sought survival sex in winter from older men who took pity, offered vodka room temperature, then bathed us with expensive bars of soap. I remember the lightness I felt underneath these men, 
who must have known I'd pocket some cash, a 10 or a 20, because they always fell asleep so quickly after. Just yesterday, I found a pair of cufflinks swiped from a guy on the Upper East Side. I must have been 19. I remember appraising them, the cabochon sapphires, the tiny single cut diamonds, the platinum dog's head. I did well that night. Contemplating, contemplated hitching to Jersey to pawn them, but didn't. Carried them in my pocket for weeks until I got financial aid and went to classes again. You're not giggling anymore. It's a hearty laugh, a snare. You tell me the root of desperation isn't always the same. Then you pin me to the bed, calloused hands digging into mine, telling me how easy it'd be to fuck me mercilessly, that taking what you want, when you want it, is your motto. Woo! last one and it, it's called Double Dutch Champion and has anyone played Double Dutch? It's this interesting jump rope game in which you have two um, jump ropes that are going in opposite directions and someone has to jump in. Don't know how to do it. It takes a lot of coordination um, but it's, it's fascinating. It's mes mesmerizing. And um, so remember that speaker I told you about? Well, there's a backstory with his vehemently racist grandmother. She was an orphan. She was dropped off at this orphanage, um, and she has no clue about her parental background. Um, so I was watching my little niece jumping double dutch one day, and I just got this vision. So double dutch champion. She was eight. She jumped double dutch at recess. Two sisters turning the ropes. She jumped double dutch. Sister Grace watched, noticed she never fumbled. Other girls watched her jump double dutch at recess. The Catholic orphanage was in Bay Ridge, 12th Avenue and 63rd Street, run by the Sisters of Mercy. Was it Bayonne her mother came from? Was it Diaper Heights or St. George? dropped off as an infant in July 1946. Think about her, war widow or unmarried. Think about him, fallen hero or married. Georgian five-story brick building, 1899, to shelter the bastards. Raised in this building, sisters in white habits watch her gracefully jump double dutch at recess before she's aged out at 11. writers and um, uh, Emily Dickinson immediately came to mind I, I mean she was a, a you know a botanist and a geologist and a biologist and an astronomer and an astrologer and I have to paraphrase her but she said something like the more I know about nature the closer I get to God was weird. something like that anyway uh, Sean that was unbelievable yes, yes. Thank you very much. Julia too. Julia, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm really happy to uh, to be able to introduce uh, Matt Falkowski to you guys. Matt is um, 17 years old, and I, this is not one of those things where uh, where I'm saying you know Matt is the, you know Matt is the brother of I'm an only child, and I, 
so I don't have to deal with that, but I'm sure that after a while you get tired of being referred to as the brother of or the sister of. But ju just for a frame of reference, if you go back to Pitt, Pinnegar and Bob Cording's reading, um, uh, Matt's sister Emily read uh, that night, and she was killer. Um, so Matt is 17, and he's a senior um, at the Arts Academy uh, here in Hartford. And what Matt is going to do is perform three or four tunes from, uh, from his debut collection called Elegy, which is in the process now of being uh, put together. And it will be out in December, are you hoping? December. Um, I mean, it's no exaggeration when they say that talent runs deep in the Falkowski family. Here's Matt.
when you tried to walk the Did you ever try to run? When you look into the mirror
on a dare in under an hour to encourage my lovely girlfriend to finish her essay. It's the best essay I ever wrote, because I need to say So uh, it's a funny story. Um, I was in a show at the Arts Academy here in Hartford. I was in West Side Story. And uh, I was playing Tony. And uh, my girlfriend, Ashley, was the assistant stage manager. And so uh, that was around the time I started dating her. And our music director uh, kind of pulled me aside and was like, hey, don't do that. I was like, I'll take my chances. So this is kind of, this song was kind of written as a joke. Um, I played it for him a few weeks ago. He thought it was pretty funny, so. So fantastic. I did not expect that sound to come out of <laughs> that. It's very cool to see the presence of, of a musician just kind of come out of a person, and that's pretty cool. I think you can hear me. I'm not. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Now it is time for Edwina. I'm so excited to hear Edwina read. Edwina is so loyal and comes to all of our readings. It is finally time to hear her read. Edwina Trentham taught English at Asinut Community College in Enfield, Connecticut for 27 years, where she was the founding editor of Freshwater Poetry Journal. Is that still in publication, Edwina? Uh, I'm not sure. You're not sure, okay. Sometimes after the person who runs it leaves, it just goes away, which is sad. Her collection of poetry, Stumbling into the Light, was published by Antrim Books. She teaches poetry workshops throughout the state of Connecticut and is a member of the Connecticut River Poets. Edwina, thank you so much for coming. Okay, now I gotta work with the mic. Oh, that worked. Oh, that's cool. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to say how wonderful how much I enjoyed Sean's reading. It was terrific. And Julia, and the music. <laughs> terrific. Oh, lovely. 
So I wanted to thank Katie and Rennie and John for all you do for poetry. Joanne. And Joanne. Joanne. Sorry, Joanne. OK, sorry. There's so many. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to do a mix of um, political, oop, I'll put it down. She had an applause. And personal poetry. <laughs> and um, I have this sort of thing about clapping. So I'm going to ask you not to clap for individual poems. You might like them, or you might not, and then you wouldn't, and then you feel like you have, and anyway, it breaks, kind of, <laughs> kind of breaks the rhythm. Okay. On October 7th this year, in response to that video on the bus, Kelly Oxford, a writer, tweeted, women, tweet me your first assaults. They aren't just stats. I'll go first, she said. Old man on city bus grabs my pussy and smiles at me. I'm 12. She got a million responses from other women. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote quite a few years ago in response to a sculpture by a wonderful sculptor called Meg Bloom. Body parts. One. She is waiting for him to go away, waiting for him to stop crushing her thin rib cage, her tender pelvis spread wide by his heavy torso, his thick leg, waiting for him to stop pinning the bones of her wrists against the hard ground. Two, she is floating listening to her arms, her wrists, her hands cry, save me. To her ribs, her belly, her thighs cry, save me. Flinging their plea into the sweet hush of summer air. Three, she is lying in a tamped down circle of grass, nothing left except a small twist of terror, all that terrible weight lifted at last. Four, she is spinning slowly under his thick weight, one leg hooked to the sky, one torn wrist raised, promising that no one will ever know how hard it was to bear that weight how hard she tried to breathe, to scream. No one will ever know. She is still lying there, a sprawl of grief and terror, a splay of body parts, waiting for him to go away. OK, um, I taught a workshop this summer I've lost my introduction, I'll just wing it. Um, I taught a workshop this summer um, called Icarus Also Flew, and it was uh, poetry as a, I mean, myth and fairy tales and the sacred as sources for poetry. And I'm just gonna read a few poems that I wrote sort of warming up for the workshop, and then one that I wrote in the workshop which will introduce a, a series of sonnets. My father, dead these 50 years and more, has forgotten how much he loved me. No longer sees the smudge on my cheek when his Time magazine slipped underneath the couch to lose itself in shifts of dust. Has long let go of those cucumbers sliced so thin for his sandwiches, my thumb wouldn't stop bleeding. Cannot even imagine that golden day I shinnied up the pawpaw tree, spicy scent of lantana spilling down the wall, much less how perfectly I divided the pulpy yellow fruit into quarters, laid them in a sun circle around the blue plate to show the glisten of black seeds a Bermudian told me guaranteed 100 years of life. The dead have short memories, losing heart much sooner than we want to believe. Okay, just um, 
I need to give you a word on this. A long tail is a species of seagull found only in Bermuda where I grew up. And as I was just saying to Sean, you know, it's, it's a volcano too, only it's larger. It's 19 miles long and a mile and a half wide. But everybody still knows everybody, let me tell you. <laughs> Wart witches. They don't look like witches. At least the one who bought my warts when I was 12 didn't. Sweet-eyed, blessed with dimples, and partial to dresses scattered with tiny flowers. She had no plans, as far as I could tell, for eating the little boy and girl I babysat alternate Saturday nights when she and her husband went for cheeseburgers at the hitching post. Still, one evening on her veranda, while I was watching her brave four-year-old Nellie's pale hair for bedtime, she nodded at my hand, the wart-crusted one that helped me remember left from right, and whispered, I'll give you a dollar for those if you want to sell them. Just hide the money. Don't tell where, and they will never come back. The scent of frangipani choked the air. A long tail hung motionless over the harbor, and a gust of wind tangled a strand of Nellie's hair around her mother's finger. My hand pinked to silk in a week. Months later, when I told my mother, she shrugged, waggled one hand at me. Oh, I sold mine too when I was nine to a witch in Newfoundland. The secret is, you can never tell where you hid the money. Um, this one is about, uh, I, about uh, the beginning of this year, I went and spent a week with a friend of mine in Schenectady because she had a new knee. She had a knee replacement. And this is basically about the intense anxiety I felt the entire time I was there. Everybody knows what a, does everybody know what Redbox is, that movie thing where you return yeah. the movies and you put them in the slot? Okay. I've read this and people say, what's Redbox? I said, you know what Redbox? What? Okay. The Monkey Bar Boy. I have driven 200 miles for my friend's new porcelain knee, glued on teacup that leaves her tentative at best on stairs. Me standing three steps down to cushion her fall with bone juts should the cat, twining in and out between legs and cane, have his way. At night, she whimpers me out of sleep, and I lie, one hand pressed against my scampering heart. Wild child kickboxing air, hurling himself along monkey bars. Mornings, on my way for her Paul Malls and cheese Danish, I turn left instead of right, barrel straight on when it's time to stop, trying not to see him, that pale-eyed monkey bar boy who hunches in the passenger seat, who trails me to shop right, snickers through my three attempts to cram last night's red box through the wrong slot, dozes in the cart's child seat, until I try to wheedle a smile from the checkout clerk, then scrambles down to join my dead mother, who waits by the door so they can link arms chat me to the car, remind me I've had trouble deciding which way to turn since I was 12 and sold that cluster of warts on my left hand to the witch who lived next door. <laughs> um, I wrote a series of poems at, in my workshop because I write along with my students, of course, as most, most teachers do. And it was a series of poems about um, an impatient queen, AKA my mother, and her children, and just like that, but, and my father. So I'm gonna read one of those because it introduces the group of sonnets that I'm, I'm going to read. And the assignment for this one was finding yourself in a fairy tale character, and I cho chose Bluebeard's wife. <laughs> <laughs> The impatient queen's youngest daughter marries unwisely. She has almost vanished by the time he chooses her, falls for her carved, beautiful bones, begs her to come away with him. Of course, she knows all about his first wife, once met his discarded mistress, and certainly regrets her best friend's pain. She thinks perhaps all three hate her, 
tries not to feel some pride at being hated because she stole him. Doesn't know he had lost interest in being married long ago. That his mistress had skin finely webbed and thin, while hers was sleek, supple as a young otter's, and he thought her friend was crazy. She tells herself she is happy, that she loves how he keeps his eyes on her all the time. But soon, she begins to lose track of her body, starts pressing her ear to walls, letting the plaster grow cold against her cheek as she slides her fingers up and down, trying to find the crack of a door. Faces hide in the oleander plates her mother gave her, and the roses outside the house run out of control. Nights, she dreams a slaughterhouse for women, where she hunches beneath a hacked wooden table, scrabbling the bloody sawdust, searching for clues one of the others may have left behind. So I got married when I was 22 uh, to another Bermudian, and we moved to Essex, Connecticut, where he had been living for a number of years. And he was 33 and had, as you got from the previous poem, had been married before. He had three children. He had um, a mistress that I met in those days. We called him a mistress. And, um, and he also had had an affair with my best friend. So it seemed like a good choice to me. Um, oh, he was an alcoholic, too. I forgot that. Details, details, if we know. So this is a series of uh, sonnet series called Dinner Parties. And it's about the first, well, it's uh, the time I spent in Essex. Dinner parties. Little pet. He tells her to wear the turquoise flowered dress, the one he bought her, with a tight elastic above her breasts. Reminds her John is his best friend, and he expects an island girl to look the part. John and Shirley have easily 10 years on him, 20 on her. But she soon finds comfort in the rattles of ice, and they pet her like a dear little cat. So she decides to ignore the hollows and the cold glitter of old quarrels, presses hands to her hot cheeks, and collapses lost in giggles when she trips upstairs to pee waits until night is early dawn to ask Shirley when love gets easier. Chooses not to hear, it never gets better. Raw. Invited to stop by for a bite with Raymond, bull-necked lawyer in love with sailing, and his wife Millie, who never goes outside except to drive their two furious teenagers to school, they pound the dolphin knocker seven times before the door flings open, thuds the wall, and they ease past Millie into woolly darkness, where dinner is scatters of rice, raw beef swaddled in bacon, a half-baked Alaska that melts in clotted pools on their plates. They all nod each time Raymond raises the bottle, lifting his eyebrows, and by the time they settle on the porch for what her mother-in-law always calls cat pee coffee, she has taught herself to shift her gaze just in time when Millie tries to catch it. Julia's feet. Right after they get back from the Vietnam War protest in DC, they are asked to a dinner party at Mac and Julia's. He has told her two things. Mac is a Korean war vet, and Julia has perfect feet. Wears sandals all year round, inside and out, except in snow, to show them off. She stops to admire Julia's ruby nails, her straight white toes in blue velvet, strappy heels, before she slips upstairs to repair the French twist he now insists she wear. She is perched before Julia's mirror, loose hair falling in tangles around her bare shoulders, when Mac's reflection snarls, hey, out of my house, you goddamn traitors. She trails past the silent guests, keeps her eyes on Julia's feet, her beautiful toes. 
switch. Weekdays, hours before he wakes, she leaves to type for a woman who makes her secretaries brush her hair for 20 minutes after they all eat lunch. At home, safe inside his hut, he stays tangled up in the spider webs of his past. Most Saturdays, they are asked to people's houses because she's so young, so pretty, and he's a tormented writer. Once they go to her doctor's house, she likes him, though he teased her when she said she skipped meals to stay thin, slapped her butt when she left, and said she was perfect. At midnight, during the dirty songs, Dr. Len decides she needs to switch dresses with his wife, who then stumble dances the room, weeping, wriggling out of the yellow striped mini, splitting it in two. Fun times. Payback. He says they must give a payback party, insists they can fit at least eight around the oak table he bought years before they married when he was rich. Speedy Cocovin is her specialty. Campbell's onion soup, consomme, chicken parts, cheap sherry, left to bake in the oven at very low heat. Who cares how long? <laughs> Time to be daring, she decides, skims magazines and selects musica the night before struggles in their galley kitchen for four hours as the living room grows incoherent. They lurch to their feet when they see her frantic smile, stagger to the table to fumble forks, spill wine onto sodden eggplant, while she listens upstairs through the bathroom grate, praying they will forget her. Selection. The richest man in this rich town takes a liking to them because his son, the one with a lazy eye, wants to be a writer too. Also, Michael, the very rich man, has a tennis court, and they, having grown up in Bermuda, play well. So one Sunday a month, when the son's in town, they make up a four, while on the sidelines, Michael's wife smiles, claps, then invites them to stay for dinner after gin and tonics. One night, when the cook goes out, but not before cooking, Michael's wife tap taps in black pumps to the wine cellar, brings up a dust sheathed bottle. When they're leaving, Michael catches her eye, shrugs because she heard him hiss at his wife. What in God's name were you thinking to waste a good wine on them? <laughs> so this is an epilogue. Um, we, sp we split up finally. Mm. Yeah, after 10 years and then after another 10 years, I went back for five. Yep, and this is after I left finally. Mm. Epilogue, exit five, Deep River. One early spring morning, there they are, standing side by side on that packed dirt pull-off near exit five, rusting Ford huddled behind them. Christina, all juts and hollows, her cobweb dress pooling around her ankles, as it did at the birthday party with elephant rides, thrown for her by the town three years before. Arnie, grinning sunlight from his eyes. She gave them to her ex with the rest when she left. A mistake, she thinks, recalling wine-warm wine -warm picnic dinners where they never took sides. Now, Christina winces herself into the back seat, shrugs and smiles at questions. At the hospital, she gives Arnie the car keys, kisses Christina's cool cheek, and walks backward down the sidewalk until they disappear. So, oh, I just want to show you something. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know Nancy Goodrich. She's a, an artist. She did this extraordinary book of illustrations for the dinner parties. They're really, they're really, they're really quite amazing. Yeah, she has the the poem, you can see the illustration through. So if anybody wants to take a look at it, it's here. Oh, and she also did a little, little flip book to go with it, too. Too cute. <laughs> I know, it's adorable. She said to me, she heard me read them, and she said, oh, I love them so much, can I illustrate them? What, I'm going to say no? <laughs> I said, yeah. So then she said, a little while later, she said, I'm going to order, a, enter a contest of, you know, handmade books and I could use gobbledygook or 
I could use your poems. Are you okay with that? And I went, yeah, sure, go ahead. go ahead. And she said, can I keep all the money if I win? I said, sure. Well, she didn't, but she sent me a book. So, for a long time now, watching climate change, I have heard this voice in my head that says to someone in the future, once there were these beautiful things called trees. So I wrote this in recently. The epigraph is by, um, from a poem by Lana Orfanides, who some of you may have heard read last month. Beautiful poet. <coughs> Bedtime story. Chestnuts, oaks, sycamores, all these that stand against the sky. Caterpillar glory by Lana Orfanides. Long ago, when we could still breathe outside, their branches in greens you cannot dream or imagine feathered the sky. Now still, now hushing, rustling, catching the wind, leaves turning red, gold, and brown before they fell, then glowing soft pink along filigrees of black in spring, which used to come before summer's wildfires and the hollow white darkness of winter. But we wanted more than more of everything. So they all dried to dust, gave up on us deep in their cores, thundered to the earth, tearing up the dead tangles of their massive roots. Sleep now, sleep. Tomorrow, I will tell you about bees. Okay, um, I, I said to Greg, do you think I should end in something upbeat? He said, uh-huh. So, <laughs> so if I can find it, I'm gonna read, yeah. So I'm gonna read two poems about my beloved Greg, um, whom I met when I was 51. And um, if I can find the really nice, happy one, it's here somewhere. Well, I may have to just read the small one I have. It's called, oh, I've got it, here we go. I've got two poems about Greg. One is oh, I wrote right after we met. As I said, I was 51 and he was a mere babe of 46. This is about our, our, one of our first dates. Bread, and there's an epigraph from a poem by Jean Valentine. Bread, she chose closed hearts, those she knew would not kill her. She sang, Jean Valentine. After our date, I sit for a week, frozen, then call to say, can I make you lunch? This our first and lasting joke. Me, pretending that I like to cook. <laughs> you, believing the perfect creamy quiche, dark spinach jeweled with baby tomatoes. Later, we walk the bare woods, then sit an hour in your car, circling our lives, the way people will, after years of believing, they'll never again tear a piece of bread in half and reach to share it with another. This last one is a poem I wrote, I guess Greggy and I had known each other probably for about six years. And um, you will note I was 51, and this was the first love poem I had ever written where I didn't take a shot at the guy in the last line. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so the moss rose is Portulaca. All of you are probably gardeners, so you know that. Today, I am one of those women. The ones I used to see walking with their lovers on city streets. And I would turn away, feel myself go pale with longing, cool with the envy I could not allow. And I would fold myself back inside, like the moss rose late on summer afternoons, who pulls the pink and yellow shells of her petals tight when the sun turns into shadows. A friend once told me how she pinched them free, those folded flowers, the first time she came upon them, thought them dead, didn't know, she said, that they were only waiting for the sun to find them again, for morning to spill its warm light, draw them out, caress them into blossom. Today, I am one of those women I used to watch, the ones whose lips are always full, 
swollen with kissing. The ones who curve their shoulders like shells so they can link their hands, clasp them tight around their lover's arms. The ones who walk with their heads thrown back in throaty laughter. The ones whose faces are always turned into the sun. Thank you. Edwina has a voice that I could listen to forever, and your poems are just delicious. So thank you so much, Edwina. That was absolutely fantastic. That wraps up our reading. Our I know Rennie has a couple of things he probably wants. Do you have any things? Do you have any? Are you going to share some poetry? Oh, well then. No. <laughs> our, our last reading of the series is the 19th of November and it features Claire Rossini and Richard Deming. Books are for sale today, so please um, purchase. Uh, and that wraps it up for me. Rennie. <laughs> no, I just, I, just, um, I just wanted to respond to, to these wonderful readings today, just, and music and all of this extraordinary occasion. And Leon, thank you again. And, uh, and uh, I have a, a couple of allusions to our friend. I want to say that uh, Claire Rossini has taken science and made it into poetry. So she is following the admonition uh, that we have heard, and I agree with that admonition. And I, I want to say, just in, in conclusion, that uh, some of us came in here somewhat yellow, and some of us came in here somewhat blue. I'm paraphrasing. And now we are all leaving very green. Yeah. <laughs>